Baruchot Abaot, ladies, thank you so much for tuning in to another edition of our weekly Torah classes, Shavua Tov. I hope you had an inspirational Chag. I have a lot to um, share with you, a lot to share with you. Uh, first of all, as you know, I just came back from, from my trip to uh, the United States of America where we had a lot of shirim there and events over there, Baruch Hashem, that were very, very successful. Also a uh, hardcore reality of what's really going on there in the United States and not understanding, still not understanding why, why people are living there. Uh, but that's for, we're going to continue with that another shiur, Be'ezat Hashem. Um, the Chag was incredible, nothing like being in Eretz Yisrael for the Chagim, to be very honest with you. One of the things that I want to share with you that happened, two things actually, is that uh, I was by a neighbor uh, eating the seuda, and I had to finish up early because there was a night, that night of Shavuot that uh, the men are usually sitting and learning the whole night. They actually uh, made an evening for ladies uh, learning Torah till 3 o'clock in the morning, believe it or not. And they invited me to be one of the speakers. Spoke, I think it was around uh, maybe 10, uh, 10 to 12 or something like that at night. And uh, as I was getting ready to leave from my neighbor's house, uh, and it was already quite late, and I had to walk to the next Ramat, Ramah Gimel, uh, all of a sudden I hear singing, groups of people singing, and I'm like, what is that? And we all run to the, um, you know, to the balcony over there, and I see, there must have been like a hundred and something men who were, I guess, walking to the shul, and all of a sudden, I guess, they stopped, and they started dancing in the middle of the street in circles, singing Sisu Vesimchu Besimcha Torah, and, and, and they were like singing about the Torah and about the giving of the Torah. And it was an incredible sight. I got, I got so emotional seeing this. And I'm like, where in the world would you see such a sight other than Eretz Yisrael? I didn't even see that in, in Bar Park. I, I never saw that in Flatbush anywhere. Hundreds of men coming together, walking to shul, dancing in circles on the streets exploding with happiness about the giving of a Kadosh Baruch Hu's Torah and certainly where I was living in in, in, uh, in Lakewood over there in that uh, uh, sorry to say God forsaken place over there you cannot do that at all because you'd have the neighbors who are the majority of which are going over there probably complaining about the noise level on the streets definitely not a place where you can uh, project openly and publicly the beauty of Torah. I have yet to see hundreds of men in that place over there uh, standing outside in the streets dancing and uh, publicizing the beauty of Torah. So that was one thing that oh, caught my attention and I, I just I was, I was overwhelmed with, with so much emo emotion just from seeing that. Uh, and secondly, while I was giving the shiur, there was a young lady over there who attended, um, who asked to speak with me after the shiur and told me a little bit about her life and how much she was struggling and how she veered off the path and what made her come back. And, and she said, you know, while you were speaking, I felt as though every single word you were saying was directed straight to me. As if God literally put the words in your mouth so that I can hear them. And, and then, you know, she told me about her personal life, which, which was sad to hear. But she said, Baruch Hashem, three months ago I decided that's it. I have to come back to Yadut. And I've been searching for, for something to fill that, that uh, spiritual void. And Baruch Hashem, I came to this uh, shiur and I heard your shiur and, and I hope to be in touch with that young lady. So I, I felt even more emotional because I was like, look at this. You never know what you're going to say that is going to inspire someone uh, either to make a change in his life or to inspire him to continue 
um, on, the, on the path of righteousness. Obviously that speech that was given was a motivating factor for this young woman and we daven for her that Be'ezat Hashem she should continue to uh, seek the truth and to elevate herself mala mala higher and higher into the realms of spirituality. Um, and of course the most incredible thing that I have yet to see is young children and when I say young, I mean eight-year-olds, nine-year-olds, ten-year-olds, my next-door neighbor's son, an eight-year-old boy, my downstairs neighbor's son, a ten-year-old boy, my upstairs neighbor's son, a nine-year-old boy, went with their fathers to learn, went with their fathers to learn. And most of them, like I asked them the next day, I'm like, so, did you manage to stay up? My downstairs neighbor's son stayed up till 4.30 in the morning. I said, what did you learn? He says, I learned Baba Metzia. What we started to learn in school, we started to learn Baba Metzia, and he opens up the Gemara, he says, this is what we learned. He went over with me what he was learning in the Bet Midash till 4.30 in the morning. My next door neighbor's son, he's eight years old. I said, Shimon, what, what, what did you learn? He says, I learned halachot and that with his father. All night, I said, when did you finally fall asleep? He says, 3.30 in the morning. And so on and so forth. My upstairs neighbor's son was up till 5 in the morning. These are young children that slept during the day in order to go with their fathers to shul, to learn Torah all night. I have a question. Where do you see that? Where do you see that? Ah, oh, Kadosh Baruch Hu should just give you all the clarity of mind and heart to make the right decision and to come join us here in Eretz Yisrael so you could be a part of this magnanimous world of spirituality. Tov. We have a lot of work to do today and sadly of course I have to mention that we got the terrible news that tr tragedy struck Am Yisrael again with the deaths of two more big Rabbanim Harav Eliyahu Abba Shaul Alava Shalom, such a tragic piece of information because he was the grandson of Harav Ben Zion Abba Shaul, who was a big, big Mekubal, Alava Shalom. And, um, and Harav Uri Zohar Ben Golda, Alava Shalom, that was like a shocker of all shockers. He was in his early 80s. He was a Choza B'Tshuva from many, many years ago. He was very instrumental in bringing back to the fold many, many, many Jews, back to Yadut, back to Kadosh Baruch Hu. He dedicated his entire life and left show business, which uh, he was a, a big part of. He was a producer, a director, an actor, a performer, and he left that world in order to, uh, to be in the service of the Rebunosh and Olam. So when we heard the news, it was, I think, Erev Chag, like a Thursday, I, I got the shock of my life. Uh, another Rav, another Rav. It's just another indication that the, the Nevoah, the prophecies, are coming to life. That as the Mashiach draws closer, more and more rabbis will ascend to the Shamaim, leaving us without anyone to, on whom to rely on other than Avinu Sheba Shamaim. And that really has to be catapult us to and direct us towards uh, the truth, that there is no one on whom to lean on. Um, I want to dedicate the shiur. Uh, first of all, it's today's uh, yard site of the holy Avraham ben Avraham, a ger tzedek, a convert to Judaism from many years ago, who lived during the time of the Gaon of Vilna, and he actually died al Kiddush Hashem, he sacrificed his entire life, left the church in order to become a Jew. And um, unfortunately, he was found out. He was hiding among the Jews in Vilna. Uh, unfortunately, sadly, a Jew was meiser on him. And uh, the Inquisition, I call it an Inquisition, even though it wasn't in Spain, um, they came after him. And uh, he did not wish to return to the church. And so he was uh, burned at the stake during the times of the Gaon of Vilna, which, I, which I, I think, if I'm not mistaken, was in the mid-1700s. 
So it says, your site today, we want to dedicate the shiur first and foremost to Avraham ben Avraham alav shalom and to a young man that I promised his mother uh, we would dedicate the next year since he passed away uh, a week and a half ago, sadly and shockingly at the age of 42 in, uh, right in front of his house he got a heart attack and he passed away and shockingly when I heard his name I almost fell off my chair because that's that he had a, a, has a very similar name to my previous Rav who also passed away at the age of 43 very very similar um, his name we want to dedicate the shield to Simantov Moshe Simantov is his first name believe it or not Simantov Moshe HaKohen Ben Tamara Allah Shalom and the, the, the stories that I heard about this young man just one, I'm just going to tell you one before we begin because it's such an inspirational story. His sister was there, I went to be Menachem Avenim while I was in the United States and um, it was in Bar Park where the family was sitting Shiva, it's a Bukharian family and his sister was telling me how uh, two years ago um, he was, uh, he, he, there was a court case it was against a particular company or something and the judge awarded him two million dollars which he received and she said you know he lived in a small apartment in Brooklyn and rather than spend that money on building himself buying a house on renovations on cars on whatever it may be on material items she said that the last two years all he did was give his money away to tzedakah and when he was nifter calls came in to his parents from all over the world regarding chassadim that this man did with that money for example they got a call from Eretz Yisrael from a particular maizid from a particular organization where the Rav told the father he says you don't even know who your son is you don't even know who your son was. With that money he was supporting ten, uh, ten men who were sitting and learning. He gave money to Almanot to be able to support themselves, widows. He married off children, Yatomim, um, orphans who didn't have the money to get married. He pretty much all he did with that money was give to Daka, give to Daka, give to Daka because he felt that money is not to be spent on myself here. If HaKadosh Baruch Hu awarded me this money, I have to give it back to him in service of his children. And that's what he did. In those two years, all he did was spend his time doing chasadim and helping people. What an incredible, inspirational story this is. There are people who have money or accumulate money, and what do they do? They hold on to it, and in their tzava'ah, they want to give it away to who? To their children, to their grandchildren. And this guy says, I'm not leaving anything for my children. I'm leaving them this legacy. He told his wife, I'm leaving them this legacy that they should learn what it is not to keep money, but to help people with that money. And he continued to live in a small apartment together with his wife and small child while helping others in despair. What a lesson of the life this is. What a lesson of life this is. So the next year, uh, we're going to be dedicating our shiurim to Simantov Moshe HaKohen Ben Tamara Alava Shalom and anyone else who also wishes to uh, contribute to the shiurim and also wants me to dedicate a shiur, whether it's Leilu Nishmat, somebody in particular, or uh, for Rufu Shalema for somebody, or for Zivu Gagun, or Hatzlacha, whatever it is, you know what to do. You could log on to www.ohelsara, Sara is without an H, ohelsara.com, and make your donation over there. Okay, we've got a lot of work to do. So uh, get out your cup of coffee. When I tell you that, it means it's going to be a nice long shiul. Uh, which you might want to take notes on because there's definitely a lot of lessons from this week's parasha in Eretz Yisrael which, which is Beha'alotcha and our parasha begins with the command of HaKadosh Baruch Hu 
to Aharon HaKohen, alav shalom, instructing him to light the menorah. Chachamim explained that Hashem wasn't only commanding Aharon to light the menorah, but rather it was also a form of appeasement. How so? Well, based on some of the events that transpired in last week's parasha, Aharon was uh, a little upset and he needed some consolation. Why? What happened in last week's parasha? In last week's parasha, every nasi, a leader from each of the tribes, brought a korban, brought an offering during the 12-day inaugural period of the Mishkan, of the tabernacle. Aharon saw this and he said, it's not fair. My tribe, Shevet Levi, did not bring a korban. My tribe was singled out and excluded. It's not fair. So Hashem told Aaron, don't worry. You'll be able to do something in honor of the inauguration. You're going to be in charge of lighting the menorah. Only then was Aaron satisfied. So the question is, what are the Chachamim implying when they say that Aaron was concerned that his Shevet, his tribe, did not offer a korban? Why did Aaron refer to Shevet Levi as his tribe? It wasn't his Shevet. I'll explain. You see, Aaron was elevated to the high post of Kohen Gadol, high priest. He was promoted to that position. Now he came from the tribe of Levi, that's true, but then he was promoted. So he's no longer considered the leader of Shevet Levi. He's now the leader of all the other priests, all the other Kohanim, and also the spiritual mentor, so to speak, of all of Am Yisrael. So who was the leader of Shevet Levi at this point? Moshe Rabbeinu, alav shalom. He was actually the leader of all of the Shevatim at this juncture. So even though it's admirable on Aaron's part that he was concerned that his tribe wasn't offered the opportunity to give a korban, that's not something that he needs to be involved in. That's something that Moshe Rabbeinu should be concerned about and deal with, not Aharon. So why wasn't Moshe Rabbeinu upset that Shevet Levi was excluded from the inaugural offerings? So there's an incredible chidush, a wonderful explanation that's a lesson to anyone in a leadership position. And the leadership position doesn't just mean a rabbi or a rabbitin. Uh, a teacher is in a position of leadership. A principal is in a position of leadership. A parent is in a position of authority and leadership. So whatever we're going to learn now applies to all of you who are in a position of authority or leadership, whether you're a parent, a teacher, a principal, a rabbi, a rebbitzin, even a manager at the bank. Doesn't matter. So what's the lesson we learn? The Torah is teaching us that once a person is elevated to an authoritative or leadership position in his community or in his circles, he cannot think only in terms of, quote unquote, his tribe. There's no longer his group, his family. Once he becomes a leader of his community or his circle, everyone in that community becomes a part of one huge Shevet. So it wouldn't have been appropriate for Moshe Rabbeinu to be upset concerning the tribe that he came from, Shevet Levi, and to ask Hashem why his tribe was excluded. And that's because Moshe Rabbeinu was now the leader of all of the Shvatim, not just his own. So Moshe Rabbeinu was teaching us a lesson through his inaction. The fact that he didn't speak up and ask Hashem, well Hashem, what happened to Shevet Levi? Why weren't they asked to bring a korban? Was to demonstrate that once he assumed the leadership position over all of Am Yisrael, every tribe is his tribe. And whatever battles have to be waged on behalf of the people must be waged on behalf of everyone and not just his Shevet, his tribe. And that's a huge lesson.
because it teaches us not to show favoritism to anyone, no matter who they are, or what their position is in the community, or where they come from, or even your immediate circle. Everybody has to be given the same attention, the same right and equal benefit of the doubt. Every person should receive a fair judgment and be looked upon with the same eyes as his neighbor. There's no such thing as a leader who will only lead a particular sect in Am Yisrael. A true leader will be open to all of Am Yisrael because everyone together is part of one unit. All Jews are connected. It wouldn't be correct, the Torah is telling us, or appropriate for any leader to place the Jewish people into segments, decompartmentalizing them, where he'll only deal with the more religious or with those who come only from his background and his nationality or those who offer the most donations or have the same hashkafot viewpoints and minhagim and customs that he has. A true leader does not divide Am Yisrael into groups. Every Jew should be rendered as equal in the eyes of a leader. Every Jew should be dealt with appropriately and with compassion and love. And every person in Am Yisrael should be tended to by that leader in accordance with their level of observance. But for a leader to say, that he only subscribes himself to a certain sect of Jews and not others. To say, I only deal with uh, Haredi Jews, I don't have anything to do with the uh, non-Haredi, non-observant Jews. I only tend to the Hasidic Jews, but not the Sephardi Jews. I'm more comfortable catering to the Litvish Jews, the more yeshivish crowd, not the Hasidim, not the Sephardim. Or, I can only offer my time to my congregants and not to anyone else outside of my shul. That's a wrong attitude to have. You don't have time for me. I'm a Yehudi. I want to talk to you. You're a rabbi. And because I'm not a congregant of your shul, you don't want to give me the time? Chachamim tell us a leader should never do such a thing. Never do such a thing because that means he's placing boundaries and limitations on who he helps and who he leads. He's segregating the people. He's picking and choosing who he's going to tend to and who, uh, who's going to have to deal with this person. Let somebody else deal with that person. I can't. They're not a part of my keilah. <laughs> that's not true leadership. And that's one of the lessons we learn in this parasha concerning authentic leadership. And uh, by the way, it's something I learned from my previous Rav, Rav Moshe Chai Simantov, Allah Shalom. That's something he always did. Anybody who ever came to him, his door was always open. It didn't matter you're from the congregation, you're not from the congregation, where you came from, who you are, what your background is. Even if you were a goy, he gave you the time. It's also something I learned from my Robin Robinson. I remember there were times I had a, uh, uh, I had a friend who, who was going through a tough time at home with her husband, with kids, and I said, why don't you speak to my Rabbanit? Because she had an issue at that time that her husband didn't really have a Rav, anybody she could talk to really and guide. So I said, why don't you speak to my Rabbanit? Maybe the Rabbanit will speak to the Rav. She's like, I don't know. So I finally managed to convince her to speak with the Rabbanit. And I, I remember asking my rabbit, and I'm like, would, would you be able to give her the time to speak with her? Her first words were, what is the question? I can't believe you're even asking me such a question. Masha'Allah, of course, I'll be happy to speak with her. And she did. And I found it amazing because she didn't say, no, I, the truth is I don't have time for her. I don't have time for her. I have 300 um, families that I deal with every day. I have a keila. The Rav has a keila. No, that's not what she did. She gave her the time of day, time and time again when she needed her. That was a lesson that Baruch Hashem, I really adapted from both my spiritual mentors, the ones who are no longer here, sadly, and the ones who are alive and well, but they should live and be well. Concerning this topic of all Jews being um, 
seen as equals in the eyes of our leaders and being tended to as equals in the eyes of our leaders and giving everybody the opportunity to be part of one unit and the leadership uh, dealing with everybody no matter what background or affiliation they're from. Uh, uh, I want to tell you that uh, when I was writing the Shi'u, uh, I always ask Hashem for Simanim that what I'm doing is good, that what I'm doing is okay. And I mean, you're not going to believe what I'm telling you now. And it's okay, but I have to call my rabbits in tonight and, and share this with her. But last night, meaning actually it was early this morning, I had a very interesting dream. Uh, I had a dream that I was in this vehicle with someone, I don't know who the someone is, I just know it was another woman with me. And, and we were driving down this, I'm not going to say road, kind of a street, a residential street that looked very interesting. It looked like Israel, an Israeli street, but I knew I wasn't in Israel. Um, it felt like I'm between here and maybe somewhere in the States. I can't really say where. And it was, I remember, it was a narrow street, and all of a sudden, as I'm coming down the street, I couldn't believe my eyes, but I see right there in front of the car was the Baba Sali, Allah Shalom, Rabbi Yisrael Abu Chatzera. And he looked, he looked good, he was with his white jalabiya, everything was white, and, and he didn't look like the pictures that most people have of him, you know, his elderly self, but he looked young and he looked um, energetic and I saw he was on his way into this Bet Midash, into a shul. And I tell the person sitting next to me, I wish I would remember who it is, I, I open the door and I tell the lady, I, if, if I see the Baba Sali, I gotta ask him for a bracha, I wanna ask him for a bracha, I wanna know if that everything I'm doing is okay. And I come out of the car, and he sees me, and I, I'm embarrassed to say Kvada because I see he's rushing into the Bet Midash. And I'm embarrassed to, to I f like in the dream, I'm embarrassed to ask him because I don't want to bother the Rav, but I can't let him go either. And I'm extending myself to him, and I'm like, Kvada Rav, and he looks at me and he realizes I want something from him, and he stops. And I look at him. And I say, Arav, Arav, please, bracha, I want a bracha, I want you to tell me that I'm doing okay. And he looks at me and he says like this, Ad mevorechet, v'yelach atzlacha, you'll continue to have bracha. And that's what he kept saying, Ad mevorechet, mevorechet, you're going to continue to have bracha, and atzlacha, akol yetov. Just like that. And he turned around quickly, and he runs into the shul. So, I was so excited, I turned to the, to the lady there, and I'm like, oh my God, I just got a bracha from the, uh, the, the, the Baba Sali. All of a sudden, I see, I guess, people heard, must have heard that Baba Sali was in town. And that's why I say I wasn't sure if it was Eretz Yisrael or, or America. It felt like people from America, but it didn't look like America. And I see them like crowding all around that area where the shul was. They were all coming to see the Baba Sali. And I come out of my vehicle, now I'm standing next to this lady, I guess, was with me. And there was a lot of people. There were ladies and men of all backgrounds and nationalities. And that's why I'm telling you this story. You had Hasidim. And over there on the right, I remember seeing all the yeshiva guys, the, the, the Litvaks, the Litaim. And over here, I remember seeing Hasidim and Sfaradim everywhere. And everybody was so happy to greet the Baba Sali. And he comes out of the shul, um, and now when he came out of the shul, all of a sudden he looked like he did in his pictures. You know, with the, the looked like an elderly man, and next to him were other rabbis, and they were all around him. And, and you, I saw this young man with a hat, with a black hat tipped up, who was obviously Ashkenazi, I'm going to tell you why he was soon, why I know he was. And obviously from the Litvisha crowd, from the Litvisha sect. Because all of a sudden he's standing not too far from the Baba Sali, meaning maybe two rabbis away, and he has a microphone and he's sing, singing tefillot in the Ashkenazic Litvisha Havara. So I know he's not Hasidi, 
because they have a different um, dialect, and he's not Sfaradi, he's a, he's a Litai, and he's uh, singing these tfilot in, in a melody, and I'm noticing that only, I was noticing that only the yeshivish Shavelt, but whoever was there from the Litvisha crowd, was joining him because they were the only ones who knew this melody. And they're singing with such fervor, and he's oy oy oying and oy oy oying, and they're all singing with him, but everyone else is quiet, and they can't, they, they're not following along because they don't know this melody. And to my right, I see the Baba Sali is, is disturbed by this. He's clearly upset with this. And he's looking around, and he notices that people, they're not joining, and they can't join because they don't know the melodies, and... He's one melody after the next, and only like maybe 20, 30 yeshivish guys there are singing along, and everyone else is quiet. They don't know this tune, and you could see the Babasali was not happy. So finally, I, I saw the Babasali uh, kind of gesturing to the young man, and he was whispering something in his ear. I rem remember thinking to myself in the, in the dream, I really want to hear what he's saying. And I was able to hear. And the Babasali tells this young man, in the nicest, sweetest way, maybe you choose a negina, a nigun, that everybody here can sing along to. That was his way of saying, uh, you, you kind of, um, you're leaving, you're excluding everyone else, and the only one singing is your crowd, you know? Maybe sing a nigun, he says, that everybody, amichad, he says to him, can join. I couldn't believe my ears when the young man had the chutzpah to tell the babasali like this. He said to him, it's okay, it's okay. Whoever wants will follow along. And you saw the babasali's face, he was so upset, and the, the, the guy realized in the dream, the guy realizes that he's upset. And now he knows that uh, he doesn't want to have dealings with the Babasali, right? So I see the guy like coming to the middle of the square. There was like a square. And he tells the Hasidim, who were uh, over there to, like, to my left, he says to them, to them now we're going to sing a melody that you know. Well, I made them feel bad. And next thing I knew, everyone starts to scatter away, starts to walk away. The only ones left there were these yeshiva guys. And the Baba Sali walks away also. And I remember thinking in the dream, wow, wow, the Baba Sali asked for unity, and we couldn't even give him that much. This boy couldn't even give him that much. And everybody walked away as if it was as if, you know, I felt in the dream like, what can we do? We're, we're not yet Ke'amechad. We're not yet Ke'amechad. But that was a dream that I had with the Baba Sali, and for me it was a. Uh, First of all, that the Baba Sari Bechal came to me in a dream and that he blessed me and that I saw this whole picture. To me, it was like a siman that the, the shi'u and the idea of leadership and what it means to bring people together and not to exclude anyone was as if the Baba Sari was saying, this is what I want. This is what I want to see from Shamaim. I want to see people together. I want to see one melody. I want everybody to be involved. I want all Jews to feel united. I want not one person to sit there in silence. I want that everybody, like he said, ke'amichad. I want them all be, to be ke'amichad. And that's what we have to strive for. But there's another lesson as well. There's another lesson we learn about leadership that's actually found in Perek Yud Aleph of this week's parasha. You could look it up. Where Hashem tells Moshe Rabbeinu, Esfali shiv'im ish, gather for me 70 people. In Hebrew, the word for people is anashim, not ish. Ish is one man, anashim are more than one. So Hashem has Moshe Rabbeinu to gather 70 ish, the singular terminology, and not anashim, which is the plural. Why? Because these 70 men were going to be the leaders of the Jewish people. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu is trying to teach us that in order for them to be true leaders, they must have the element of ish. What's ish in this context? Well, the word ish is used twice in the Torah. The first time is in Sefer Shemot 
where the Pasuk states, Hashem Ish Milchama, God is like a man at war at times. The second time the word Ish is used in, is in our parasha, where it states, Veha Ish Moshe Anav, and the man Moshe was humble. So the Torah is telling us about the dual role of a leader. He must be an Ish. What kind of Ish? The kind of man that Moshe was. He's got to be humble. The leader must deal with the people in a modest fashion. He shouldn't be the kind of leader who's consumed by power and glory and he's always looking for kavod, for honor. Ish Moshe Anav. A true leader should possess the attribute of humility. But at the same time, the humble leader cannot allow his humility to cause him to veer off the path of Musar. Humility should never stop a leader from taking a stand when he sees incorrect behavior in his students, in his community, in his neighborhood, in his family. He shouldn't be afraid of protesting against the things that oppose Torah values. A humble leader should not use his humility as an excuse to bow out of providing Musar to the people because of his fear of how they're going to react, what they're going to say. Sometimes a leader has to take the stand of the Ishmil Hama. He must be a man who wages war in defense of the Ribono Shalolam. So there's a dual role a leader plays. He must be an Ish Anav, a humble person. And sometimes he must be an Ishmil Hama, a man who will do battle in order to maintain God's honor in the world. That's why HaKadosh Baruch Hu commanded Moshe Rabbeinu saying, Esfali Shiv'im Ish, gather for me 70 Ish, not a Nashim. HaKadosh Baruch Hu wanted these 70 leaders to learn the lesson of Ish. He wanted them to understand that sometimes they're going to have to take the position of the Ish Milchama and sometimes to utter that which is unpopular and difficult for people to hear. A good leader has sometimes, you know, he has to sometimes approach the community as an Ish Milchama while at the same time maintaining his humility. So he's got to be the Ish Anav, and he's got to be humble and functioning from that place while knowing when to take that stand as the Ish Milchama. But there's a third lesson in, in our parasha that pertains to leadership, and Moshe Rabbeinu was the one who teaches us this lesson. Moshe Rabbeinu tells Hashem that he's an elderly man now, that perhaps arrangements should be made to seek out his replacement, somebody else who can lead the people in his stead. And he also approaches God because Am Yisrael was, as usual, in the Midbar, complaining again. So Moshe tells HaKadosh Baruch Hu, He'anuchi har'iti et kol ha'amazeh? Did I conceive this entire nation? Im anuchi yeliditi hu? Did I give birth to them? that you tell me that you tell me carry them in your bosom like the nurse carries the suckling I mean you're asking me Hashem to take care of them and tend to them like a woman who's carrying a nursing baby what is Moshe Rabbeinu saying to Hashem over here He's providing us with an insight into the world of leadership. A true leader deals with the people like a mother handles her nursing baby. One thing is demanded of a nursing mother. Patience. Why? Because the baby wants to eat when he wants to eat and that's at any hour of the day or night. The baby has a diaper that has to be changed a number of times a day, even in public, and that's not easy for the mother at times. So does the mother become angry with the baby or begin to berate the baby because of his needs? 
The mother, like everybody else around her, understands this is an infant over here. So a mother displays patience towards her nursing baby. And Moshe Rabbeinu teaches us that every leader must possess the midah, the attribute of patience. When a leader deals with so many people from various backgrounds, nationalities, and religious customs, it's not easy at all because uh, each person has his own opinion, uh, so he's got to be patient with them. Sometimes even the people try to sway the leader towards their side, so he's got to be patient. Some people need their undivided attention. Some people demand a lot from their leader. And also, whenever a problem arises, no matter what time of day or night it is, it's that dedicated leader who answers the door to deal with these people. A true leader's door is open 365 days a year, 24 hours a day. So Moshe Rabbeinu teaches us that a true leader in Am Yisrael must regard the people like nursing infants. He needs to tend to their needs with patience, just as he would for his own baby. And just like he wouldn't lose patience with his nursing baby because he understands the needs of that infant, the same is true concerning Am Yisrael. They too need to be cared for, cared for and tended to with patience, with understanding, and with love. So there are three major lessons we just learned. One, that a true leader should tend not only to his own congregants, his own family, his own neighborhood, but to any Jew who seeks him out. You never close a door to a Jew. He must find, the leader must find the time to help every Jew, not just those from his own kehillah. That's one lesson. Secondly, he must have the attribute of a humble man, the Ishanav, and yet be the Ish Milchama, a man of war, if need be. And number three is that a genuine and compassionate leader has to care for the people, Kasher Yisa Haomen et Hayonek, like a nursing baby is cared for, with patience and with understanding. Moving on. The Torah HaKadoshah informs us that after HaKadosh Baruch Hu instructed Aharon to light the menorah, Aharon immediately obeyed, just as the Pasuk says, Vaya'as ken Aharon, and Aharon did as HaKadosh Baruch Hu commanded. He listened to the instructions of Hashem and followed all the laws of lighting the menorah. And Rashi HaKadosh Alav HaShalom comments on the words Vaya Asken, and Aaron did, and he writes, Lehagid Shivcho. The Torah HaKadosh told us that Aaron obeyed and did as he was commanded in order to praise him. What's the praise? Says Rashi. Melamed Shina. The Torah is teaching us that Aaron did not deviate from Hashem's words. He didn't change anything that was told to him. So the question is, why would Aharon change Hashem's command or deviate from God's instruction? I mean, think about it this way. If Hashem asked us to light the menorah in a specific way, wouldn't we also light it according to His instructions? Imagine now that after you light the menorah, just like HaKadosh Baruch Hu wanted you to, someone comes along and praises you in front of people, and he says, look everybody, she did it. She lit the menorah the way God told her to. What do you mean? I mean, of course you're going to do it as you are instructed. If Hashem tells you to do something, would you deviate from his instruction, from his direction? So why do you deserve such a pat on the back for not changing the instruction of Hashem. Why the praise for not having changed anything? Shina. Why is Rashi HaKadosh applauding Aharon? Ah, Melamed Shina. But obviously he's not going to change the directives of Hashem. The Torah is teaching us that Aharon, Aharon didn't change Hashem's command and, and, and for that he deserves to be praised. Uh, how do we understand uh, Rashi's commentary? What does that mean, that Aharon lo shina, that he didn't deviate from God's command? 
So Rabbanim teach us that man's nature is such that he grows accustomed to any circumstance that he's placed in, especially concerning the things that he does time and time again. Now, consistency concerning the mitzvot is praiseworthy. We applaud somebody who's involved with mitzvot every single day and never misses a day because he's so consistent. But we have to be careful since consistency can breed a rote and mechanical attitude. If we're not wary enough, many items of life can become very robotic. Sometimes, become we be, because we become so accustomed to the routine of life, even if it's in the area of spirituality, we can chas v'shalom lose the excitement and the enthusiasm. Somehow, when we do something more than once, the novelty and the fervor that we feel tends to fade away. And eventually we, we, we end up doing things in a very mechanical fashion without much passion, without exhilaration. And that can happen in every aspect of life and of religion, no matter what area it is, even between a man and his wife. So the key to a life filled with fervor and passion is to hold on to that original feeling and never lose it. And if you never had the original feeling, then you have a problem. <laughs> then you have a problem. Then you have to work on creating one. But the point is that that was the greatness of Aharon HaKohen. When Rashi comments that he didn't deviate, Shiloshina, it means that the excitement he felt on the first day that he lit the menorah was the excitement that he felt a week later. It's the same anticipation that he felt a month later. It's the same exhilaration he felt a year later. And that's something to applaud. That's something praiseworthy. Remember when you were in school and your mother bought you a new notebook for the upcoming year? How excited were you to write in that clean, crisp notebook? How neat were the first few pages as you carefully took notes with such diligence and excitement? Remember we used to write on the top right-hand corner of every page, Beisamech Dalid, B-S-D, which means Besiata Dishmaya, which means with the help of heaven. We even we used to put the date on the page so we should keep track of when we took the notes. But if we'd skip to page 75 of the notebook, what do you notice? The writing is not as perfect as it was on page one. The sentences are a little sloppier. There are more abbreviations. Some pages don't have the date on them anymore. Some of the pages we forgot to add, Beis Samech Dalid. There's some doodling on the page. By the time you reach the end of the notebook, it's pretty much filled with cartoon characters, scribbling and babbling. What happened? What happened? In the beginning of the year, you were so happy to have that notebook. You were excited to use it. You took care of it. It was important for you to keep your notes neat and legible. But as the year progressed, as it happens to most people, taking notes every day became routine. And at some point, it even became burdensome to you. So you lost that fervor. And you treated that notebook as if you just want to move on already. But the key to life is never to fall behind when it concerns the important things and important people. We must always maintain that fire and enthusiasm. For example, many people are excited about the new classes they've joined, uh, new friendships they've founded, new spiritual endeavors they took upon themselves. But the Torah does not just take the beginning into consideration. We look at the end. 
who joined the class and stayed until the end of the course maintaining the same excitement that they had when they first joined who took upon themselves a mitzvah that they were excited about in the beginning of the year and not only are they displaying that excitement still the following year but they still hold that mitzvah they didn't remove it who loved being your friend in the beginning and remained your friend 20, 30, or 40 years later through the very end. In Judaism, things are not measured only by how it all began, but also by how it ended. How you reacted to trials when things became increasingly challenging for you. Did you maintain the same passion and fervor that you had at day one, even though you're now holding by day 365? So the Torah wants to know who will be there through everything from the beginning to the end, through the ups and the downs, through the pressures and the stumbling blocks of life. That's the key to a fulfilling spiritual life. We all need to see to it that consistency doesn't lead to a rote attitude of life, to mechanical and robotic actions. We need to figure out ways to light the fire of enthusiasm and then maintain it. We need to see the beginnings through to the very end. And the Gemara, as well as the Midash Tan Choma, teaches us this very concept. Hamatchil b'mitzvah omrim lo gmo. He who begins to engage in a mitzvah, we tell him, complete the mitzvah. What does that mean? On a simple level, Chachamim explained that if someone began to engage in a mitzvah, it's his full right to complete the mitzvah. You shouldn't come along and then try to take that mitzvah away from him. For example, in shul, the person who opened up the hechal kadosh should be the one to close the hechal. Why? Why shouldn't someone else be given the opportunity and the schot? Because of this concept. Hamatchil b'mitzvah omrim lo gmor. The one who began the mitzvah should be the one to have the right to complete it and nobody should take that away from him. That's the simple explanation. But there's something else we could learn. Hamatchil b'mitzvah. Someone who begins a mitzvah is very excited to do so. But we know, we just learned, that the nature of man is such that eventually the excitement fades away and we don't know if that person is going to make it to the end. Therefore, we inspire him. Omrim lo, we urge him and we say, Gmur, finish what you started. We have to motivate him to complete his mission, to complete his task or any spiritual obligation in the proper way. We encourage him not to leave things unfinished or half done without any closure. We help him to have the same enthusiasm that he had at the beginning, also to have it at the end. So we become his support system so that he maintains the motivation to continue along the path of mitzvot that he set out upon to begin with. But we don't do the opposite. We don't see him, listen, cooling off, veering off, not interested so much, and then we say to him, oh, poor you, it's too hard for you, you're overwhelmed, you can't handle it, you took too much upon yourself, you weren't ready, it's too intense for you, no worries, you don't have to continue, you could stop. You could stop. You could turn around and head back in the other direction. Hashem will understand. What matters, what's most important, is that you started. That you had good kavanot. You had all the good intentions. We don't do that. We don't do that. Hamatchil b'mitzvah omrim lo gmo. We encourage him. We support him. We urge him. We inspire him. And we hold his hand through it all and to the finish line. It might take him longer because it's hard for him. It might take him longer because he can't handle it right now. It might take him longer because uh, he's, he's not yet ready. 
but we'll take him to the finish line. We're not going to tell him, give up. Sadly, the nature of man is such that he wants to be matril. He wants to begin his road of spiritual greatness, but he doesn't always get to the finish line. So the Torah is encourage, encouraging us to complete what we started, no matter what that is. And we should complete it in the proper way and not leave things hanging, incomplete, and unmaterialized. That was the greatness of Aharon. Aharon was asked to light the menorah every single day. His excitement of lighting the menorah did not diminish as time went on. His enthusiasm remained the same as he did when he lit the menorah on the first day, on day one. Vayas ken. So he did as he was commanded, and that means melamed sheloshina. The Torah is praising Aharon for not faltering from his emotions, from his feelings of enthusiasm towards the mitzvot. So I guess the question is, how can we maintain that zeal and that passion and the fervor? Well, that's a huge question. And the consensus of the majority of Chachamim is that the answer is, you should be involved in what you're involved in right now, at this very moment. You're engaging in the study of Torah and Musar. The purpose of these shiurim, of these lectures, isn't only to provide you with information and to teach you interesting concepts. The purpose of these lectures is to reawaken in you the life and the spirit of Judaism inside of you. It's to create an excitement in your neshama, to infuse your souls with inspiration. These shiurim are like coaching sessions. They're meant to motivate you to begin to be matril, to take something upon yourself, to begin to act, and then to see you through to the very end. The motivation of Judaism comes from the study of Torah and Musar. And that's why it's so important that you don't fall off the bandwagon when it concerns our lectures. You have to keep tuning in and every week learn the next lesson because that's what's going to keep you motivated. That's what's going to keep you spiritually energized. That's what's going to keep you, uh, and not just maintain you, but elevate you further. And that's something we learn from our parasha which Rav Gifter Alava Shalom points out. He says that if you notice, the Torah informs us, uh, informs us of something that Bnei Israel did that the Gemara actually describes as a terrible sin, terrible mistake that they made. What was the terrible act? The Torah tells us that the Jewish people left Har Sinai. They were at Har Sinai in order to receive the Torah, and after a while, they left. That was their crime, that they left. So the Rabbanim wonder, well, why was this such a terrible sin? What, we, we expected them to stay there forever. At some point, they're going to move away from Har Sinai. Why are they penalized for having left Har Sinai? Chachamim explained that the problem was not that they had to leave. The problem was how they left. That was the grave sin. How did they leave? They left with a horrible attitude. It was the attitude of a tinok haboreach mi betasefer. They left like a little child who runs away from school. A child who hears the bell ringing at the end of the day and zippity doodah, he's out the door, out. The bell rang, so to speak, and Am Yisrael was looking for the quickest exit. A child can't wait to run out the door because he doesn't want the teacher to say another word or to teach him anything else. He doesn't want to have to carry another book home or to receive one more homework assignment. He wants school to end. So, the Gemara says that sadly that was the attitude of the Jewish people when they left Har Sinai. 
Well, what does it mean that they left Har Sinai like a child who runs away from school? The Chachamim explained that there was another time when the Jewish people were tested, and that's when they left Egypt. After the Egyptians drowned in the sea, Moshe Rabbeinu told Bnei Israel to move on, that they had to move on as quickly as they could, they got to get to the next place. As the Pasuk says, Vayasa Moshe et Israel miyam suf. Moshe Rabbeinu led Israel away from the Red Sea. And uh, Shia Kadosh comments that Moshe Rabbeinu had to actually lead them away against their will. Many people didn't want to go, they didn't want to move. They wanted to wait, they wanted to stick around, they were stalling. Why were they stalling? And Rashi explains, based on the Midash Tanchuma, that when the Egyptians came up after us, if you remember they were chasing us, and they were chasing us into the sea, they adorned their horses and chariots with ornaments, says Rashi, of gold and silver and precious stones. And when they all drowned in the sea, their spoils and treasures were floating in the water. So Rashi says that the wealth that Am Yisrael was busy collecting there uh, on, on the ocean front was a greater plunder than what they took when they left Egypt, if you could imagine. So Moshe Rabbeinu was telling them, listen, we really have to get going over here. We need to move on. But the people said, wait, Moshe, wait, <laughs> give us more time because we're still collecting all the wealth. Please let us do what we need to do. But Moshe was busy urging them to move on. And when it came time to leave Har Sinai, Moshe Rabbeinu also told the people, Rabotai, uh, it's time to leave this place. We need to move on from here to the next stop. How did the people respond then? They said, oh, we're moving on? We're going? That's it? We're leaving? Oh, okay, sure, great. <laughs> Let's leave. Yahoo! We're happy. Oh, oh. That upset Hashem. Hashem said, what do you mean, let's leave? Okay, what do you mean you're ready to get up and go so quickly? Hashem was like, when it came to collecting the spoils and treasures of Egypt, you didn't want to go. You knew that it would benefit you to stay a little longer, so you were begging Moshe to wait because you claimed you couldn't just leave all that wealth behind. You wanted to stay to collect the treasures that would benefit you. How come you didn't have that same attitude when it came to Har Sinai? Har Sinai was the place where you were collecting many mitzvot, where you were elevating yourself spiritually. You were gathering chidushei Torah. So even if it was Moshe Rabbeinu who told you that it's time to leave, your answer should have been to him what you said back then. Wait a minute, Moshe Rabbeinu. Maybe Hashem is going to offer us another mitzvah in the Torah. Maybe we'll be zeichet to hear another chidush. Perhaps we're going to experience another revelation. We can't just leave this place that provided us with so much spiritual elevation. We can't just leave this place from one day to the next. You have to give us a little bit more time. Hashem tells the people, but that's not what you said. Instead, as soon as Moshe told you it's time to leave, your immediate response was, okay, no problem, we're ready to go, let's go. You behaved like a, a tinok, haboreach mi beta sefer. You made it seem as if, as if you couldn't wait to leave the scene. The claim against the Jewish people was that they weren't as stubborn about leaving Har Sinai as they were about collecting the wealth. When it came to the money, to something they felt would benefit them, they stood up for themselves. They fought with Moshe Rabbeinu. They were akshanim, says the Midrash. They were stubborn about leaving. They even stood up to Moshe. They yelled out, we don't want to leave yet. Please, Moshe, let us do what we need to do. We have to collect this wealth. If Hashem put it out here in front of us, we got to take advantage of it. They argued with Moshe. <laughs> but when they left Har Sinai, they were much too obedient. 
Suddenly they listen to Moshe. And the Midrash says they should have resisted, says Rav Gifter. They should have displayed a stubbornness to leave the site that elevated them. But the fact that they were so obliging and they didn't protest, even if it was Moshe Rabbeinu, they should have protested, was like the child who ran away from the school the minute he heard the bell going off. So Rav Gifter tries to explain to us the attitude that Bnei Israel had and he says in order to explain that kind of attitude we have to understand what the attitude of a child who uh, runs away from school is then we'll understand what the problem with Klai Yisrael was and he asks well what is that child so excited about that he's now going home after all, he knows he's got to come back to school the next day. It's not like he's really uh, free now from his learning obligations. So he runs home uh, for, for the next nine, ten hours. But the following morning, he still has to go back to school and face his teachers. He still has to sit in the classroom again the next day. So why does this child run away from school with such an excitement? And Rav Gifter explains that for that child, it's a break from the action. He knows that the next day he's going to have to go back to school, that he's going to have to dive in again with everybody in the morning, that he's going to sit in the same classroom again with the same teachers. He knows that. But in his mind, the break provides him with a respite between one day and the next. He feels he could kind of relax between days. Says Rav Gifter. That was exactly the problem with Bnei Israel. When they left Har Sinai, no matter where they were going to travel to in the Midbar, they'd still be obligated to keep the mitzvot and to learn Torah. Wherever they travel to, they're still going to be required to maintain the same spiritual levels. But when they left Har Sinai, they were hoping to get a break from their spiritual obligations. They were hoping that the intensity that they experienced at Har Sinai would cease at least until they arrived at the next stop. The attitude, says Rav Gifter, that kind of attitude is a great danger when it comes to life and religion. A break in spiritual action leads to dangerous places. It actually leads to a spiritual decline. When there's a pause and you're not maintaining Judaism in the proper way, Yahadu takes on a different face, he says. And Rav Gifter compares it to a tea kettle that's on the fire. And just as it's about, it's about to whistle, oh, you remove it from the flame. And then again, you put it back on the fire again, and again, just as it's about to whistle, oh, you remove it from the fire. What happens? The water never comes to a boil. You never complete your mission. You never complete your tikkun. Why? Because you remove the tea kettle from the fire much too early. The tea kettle, that tea kettle, it could be on the fire for the next 10 hours and the water is never going to come to a boil because you keep removing the tea kettle from the fire too early just as the water is about to boil over. If you would leave the kettle on the fire for five minutes straight without touching that kettle, the water would eventually come to a boil and you would enjoy a nice hot cup of tea. Says Rav Gifter, the same is true concerning Yadut. Consistency is very important. So even the child who runs away from school and he's so excited because he thinks he has a few hours of rest, the Torah tells that child, you're not off from Torah or from learning, little boy. Even for those 10 hours that you think you're off, that you're free, you're not free. Because everything you learned in school, you now have to apply outside of school and in your home. You don't stop being Jewish just because you're not in school. You don't stop engaging in mitzvot just because the bell rang. So that attitude of being happy to rest from the intensity of spirituality, says Rav Gifter, can cause a decline in spirituality. It stunts 
your spiritual growth. And that's especially true during the summer months. You know, I, I, uh, I tutor a lot of kids via Zoom. And there are some students who, at the end of the year, I've taken them through this long spiritual process. At the end of the year, you see the fire of Torah in their eyes. They're so motivated. They're so excited about Torah, about mitzvot, about Hashem. And when they come back from the summer break, they're like totally different people. It's like they disappeared somewhere. Somehow their enthusiasm melted away with the heat of the summer sun. So, no matter where we find ourselves during the summer, we have to see to it that we maintain our spiritual fervor so that when we arrive at the month of Elul, the, which is right after the summer month, right? The month of tshuva, the month of rectification, we're just as spiritually energized and charged as we were before. Which means that spiritual maintenance is important all year round. Moving on, at the end of our parasha, we find the famous story of Miriam Hanevi'a Alea Shalom who spoke Lashon Hara about her younger brother, Moshe. What happened over there? The story goes that there were two Nevi'im, two prophets named Eldad and Medad, who were prophesying in the Jewish encampment. Just then, Tzipporah, Moshe Rabbeinu's wife, noticed them and while she was speaking with Miriam, her sister-in-law, she says to her, Oh, these are Nevi'im? These are prophets, right? I, I feel bad for their poor wives. So Miriam hears it, she says, uh, Why poor wives? What, what's wrong? And Sipora says, Well, because if you're a prophet, you can't live with your wife anymore. That's why Moshe, your brother, is no longer living with me. He's a prophet. So he needed to separate himself from me. And Miriam was shocked. She says, what? Moshe is no longer living with you? What kind of business is this? What do you mean? I'm, I'm also considered a prophetess, and I'm still with my husband. Aharon, my older brother, is a Navi, and he's still living with his wife. And they began to speak about Moshe. They weren't necessarily speaking in a derogatory way. They were trying to make sense of things, like, why is this happening? I mean, I'm, I'm a prophetess. My brother, other brother's a prophet, and we don't have to separate. Why is Moshe separating? What's going on over here? But it's then that HaKadosh Baruch Hu begins to rebuke Miriam, and he tells her the following. Do you know who you're talking about? When you speak about yourself, you think you could compare yourself to your brother Moshe? Moshe is on a completely different level. He tells her, Moshe bechol beiti ne'emanhu. He's my faithful servant. I communicate with him face to face. And then he says to her, Umadua lo yeretem ledaber be'avdi be'moshe. Why aren't you afraid to be speaking against my servant, Moshe? And then something very interesting happens. In the middle of this whole story, the Torah Dajah suddenly takes a turn and states the following. Moshe anav mikol adam asher al adama. And the man Moshe is exceedingly humble, more so than any other man on the face of this earth. In the middle of the story, as we're being told that Miriam spoke Lashon Hara, the Pasuk informs us that Moshe was exceedingly humble, and then we're told that Hashem rebuked Miriam and punished her. So all the Chachamim want to know what that Pasuk about Moshe Rabbeinu's humility is doing there smack in the middle of this Lashon Hara story. Because the story seems to be flowing nicely. We have Eldad and Medad prophesizing, we have uh, Tzipporah seeing them and, and commenting to Miriam about how badly she feels for their wives because they're probably separated from their wives, like Moshe separated himself from her. Miriam can't believe it, she begins to comment, she even approaches her brother Aharon about it, they talk about it. And then all of a sudden, the Pasuk tells us smack in the middle of all of this nice flowing story 
that Moshe Rabbeinu was exceedingly humble, more so than any other person on the face of this earth. And then after that, we continue with Miriam's rebuke and her punishment. What is this pasuk doing smack in the middle of the story? You know what the answer is? The Torah is telling us, do you know what caused this entire story, all this trouble? Moshe Rabbeinu's humility, his anava. His anava, how did Moshe Rabbeinu's midah of humility cause all this trouble? Well, Chachamim tell us that when Moshe realized that he reached a very high level of spirituality and prophecy, he probably told Zipporah, his wife, my dear wife, as you know, Hashem gave me the gift of prophecy, and therefore I have to separate myself from you, because that's what Hashem wants. And that's what Zipporah conveys to Miriam about Eldad and Meidad, right? What does she say? I feel bad for their wives, because if they're prophets, it must mean that they can no longer live with their wives. But that wasn't really the case. That wasn't really the case. You see, Moshe Rabbeinu knew that he was special. He knew that not every Navi, not every prophet is obligated to separate himself from his wife because not everyone is on that exalted level of prophecy that he was on. So technically, Moshe Rabbeinu could have told his wife the following, could have said, Tzipporah, you should know that I'm not the standard prophet. My name is Moshe Rabbeinu. I talk to God face to face, so I'm a very holy man. You should know that you didn't marry a typical prophet. You married the greatest Navi, and uh, that's the price that you have to pay for being married to such a great man. What can we do? What can we do? That's not what he said. And we know he didn't say that because notice how humble he was. He didn't flaunt his spiritual levels to Tsipora. We could assume that he told his wife, I'm a prophet and therefore I need to separate myself from earthly matters. That's it, that's all he said. And we know that's probably what he said because when Sephora sees Eldad and Meidad, what does she immediately think? She assumes that since they're also prophets, they too must be subject to the same rules and regulations as her husband, and that wasn't the case at all. Moshe was a prophet that superseded all other prophets, and his obligations were different than everybody else. His levels of spirituality were different than all the other Nevi'im. But his humility didn't allow him to separate himself, to set himself apart from the other Nevi'im. And that's what caused Tzipora to assume what she did about Eldad and Medad's wives. That's what made her think that it was because Moshe Rabbeinu probably didn't reveal his greatness to her. And that's also what caused Miriam to comment and say what she did. What did Miriam say? She said, wait a second over here. We're prophets too, and we don't have to separate ourselves from our spouses. <laughs> that's exactly the point. That's exactly the point. The Torah had to interject in the middle of this entire story in order to inform us that this entire episode took place dafka because of Moshe Rabbeinu's great humility. The Torah wanted to demonstrate the level of his humility where even to his own wife he didn't share his greatness. Even to his own wife he didn't boast about his levels of spirituality. He left his greatness concealed from his own wife where it's uh, natural for a spouse to share his accomplishments with his partner. I mean, think about it. Some men come home and they share what they did or who they helped. They say, uh, oh, my dear wife, you should know that today I helped the neighbor across the street with his flat tire. Uh, it felt so good to help this one. Um, I'm so glad to be able to give this one a loan. They, they share these things. But that wasn't Moshe Rabbeinu who Hashem attests concerning him that even when it came to his own wife and the things that a man would normally share with his wife, he was such an anav, he was so humble, 
that he kept his deeds and level of greatness all to himself. And that's why Tsipoa thought that Eldad Eldad and Medad had the same spiritual obligations Moshe did. That's why Miriam made her comment, which was considered Lashon Hara. And and then, of course, she's then punished for uh, speaking about her younger brother. She's punished with, uh, she's stricken with leprosy, with tzarat, for a period of seven days. During those seven days, Bnei Israel remained encamped and they didn't travel. They waited for Miriam to recover from her affliction. Now try to imagine that for a moment. Two million people are all in a state of pause because one woman was ill and in solitary confinement. HaKadosh Baruch Hu actually commanded the people saying that they cannot travel until Miriam recovers from the Tzarat. And the Chachamim and the Gemara wonder, should an entire nation, millions of people, wait due to one afflicted person? Why should they all wait? Why should they all wait? And the Gemara states that this was Miriam's due reward because there was a time in her life where she waited for someone. When was that? When Moshe Rabbeinu was an infant and placed in the basket upon the Nile River, the Torah tells us that Miriam followed the basket as it flowed down the Nile River and she waited and waited and watched over the basket to see what would happen with her younger brother. So the Gemara tells us, in the schut, in the merit of Miriam waiting and assuring that her brother was safe, Hashem rewarded her in kind and the Jewish people years later waited for her. Chachamim tell us that on that day that Moshe Rabbeinu was placed on the Nile River, really, Miriam could have continued with her life and gone home and prayed for him at home, far away from the river. She could have said, once my mother put this basket in the river, what could I do already? All I could do is pray and hope that whatever happens should be for the best. But that's not what she did. She was so concerned about the welfare of her younger brother Moshe that she couldn't just move on and go home until she waited and waited and knew with certainty that he was safe and he was sound. And Hashem was so moved by that gesture that he said, because you waited out of concern, the entire nation will wait for you out of their concern for you when the time comes. No one will leave you behind in the same way you wouldn't leave your brother behind. And I once heard a Rav comment on this, so beautiful, and he said, you know, it's wonderful that Hashem responded to Miriam, Nida keneged Nida, measure for measure, and we see here in the story how Hashem calculates all our actions and measures them perfectly. Miriam waited, so the nation waited for her. It's a perfect Nida keneged Nida. But why now? Why did Hashem orchestrate it in such a way that after Miriam spoke Lashonara and was stricken with Tzarat, the nation waited for seven days in order to move on. Why specifically at this point was this payback given to Miriam? And this Rav explained that very brilliantly that as a result of this story, when, uh, you know, when Miriam spoke about her brother Moshe, Hashem felt a need to come to his defense. Hashem uttered the most beautiful words about Moshe, words that were never spoken about anyone the way HaKadosh Baruch Hu spoke about Moshe. HaKadosh Baruch Hu called Moshe his trusted one. Bechol beitina emanhu, pe el pe adaberbo. 
He tells Miriam that he speaks with Moshe through very clear visions that most prophets don't merit to have. Hashem asks her why she wasn't afraid to speak about his faithful servant. God defends Moshe to Miriam with an entire speech about how wonderful her brother is and how no one is like him. And it's at this point that we truly realize who Moshe Rabbeinu really was. At this point, we also realize what a great deed Miriam did all those years ago when she waited just a little while longer to see what would happen with her baby brother. At the time that she waited to see what would happen, it was a simple act of a sister waiting for her little brother, making sure that he was all right and safe. I mean, it makes sense. Should be the natural reaction to most. But it's not a major story over here that she waited. But when you fast forward the clock and you realize who that baby turned out to be, what he accomplished, who he became, how many people he saved, what he brought to the world, and what Hashem thought about him. Oh, oh, oh. So now Miriam waiting just a little while longer to make sure her brother was okay becomes a huge item in history. Miriam has an enormous schut in the history of her brother Moshe because she just didn't turn around and walk away hoping it would all turn out well. She stood there and waited and waited and watched and made sure with her own eyes that Moshe was safe and secure. And then when she saw Batia retrieved the basket from the Nile, she didn't stop there either, she didn't go home. She recommended to Batia that, uh, that, that, that the baby be nursed by Yocheved, who we all know was Moshe's mother. So she, you see that she saw Moshe through safety. And years later we understand that the little brother she waited for and watched over was not a typical baby. He turned out to be Moshe Rabbeinu, the man who Hashem crowns as his faithful servant, the man who ascended to the heavens and remained there for 40 days and 40 nights in order to retrieve the Torah for Am Yisrael. This was Moshe who parted the sea with the Mate Elohim that he was endowed with. This was the Moshe who spoke with the Kadosh Baruch Hu clearly face to face this was Moshe who was deemed by God himself to be So what seemed like a very insignificant act of Miriam waiting around all those years ago when Moshe was an infant turned out to be the greatest act she could have done. So as a result of this current story in the Midbar, this story here of the Lashon Ara magnified what she did in the past and how great that deed was. The fact that Hashem came to Moshe Rabbeinu's defense and spoke the way he did about him only amplifies the greatness of Miriam's act all those years ago because that was Hashem's way of telling her, Miriam, don't talk about Moshe, don't talk about him because that infant that you waited for and Baruch Hashem that you waited for him, Baruch Hashem he didn't just turn around and walk away, that you looked after him, look who he became, look who he became. And that's a great lesson about waiting just a little bit longer to make sure that Be'emet all is truly well before moving on. And also the, the lesson of the magnitude of schuyot, of merits that a person accumulates when he sees things through properly, honorably, and with great care. 
המתחיל במצווה, אומרים לו, גמור. מרים didn't even know that she was waiting and watching over an infant who would one day grow up to be the greatest redeemer of Am Yisrael, the, the, the greatest Navi of all time who would speak to Hashem face to face. You know what that teaches me? You could never know about an action at the time that you're doing it because you never know what that action will produce in the future, both good and not so good. Only in the future could we look back and marvel at the wonder of our good deeds and how when we took care of things in the proper way, it produced the most incredible results. But then we have to be careful because the opposite is also true. Sometimes the future teaches us about what we should not have done and how we should have waited and what merits we lost along the way that were meant to be ours and what we relinquished because of that. So Miriam teaches us that although waiting for her brother and seeing him through to safety seemed like a very insignificant act, very simple act. Only years later, when HaKadosh Baruch Hu testifies on behalf of Moshe Rabbeinu and informs her, and he informs us too, of who this man really is, only then do we understand the magnitude of the great deed that she did all those years ago. So the fact that Miriam waited that was not a simple act. Her refusing to leave the scene, her waiting just a little bit longer, just to make sure, I just want to make sure it's all truly well, it's all going to be good. I want closure, I want this to end well. That was what the Jews back at Har Sinai should have done when Moshe Rabbeinu told them that it was time to go. They should have done what Miriam did. They should have told Moshe Rabbeinu, listen, Moshe, we need to wait just a little bit longer to see what's going to develop here before we walk away to the next station. Miriam waited. That was her greatness. She waited. And greatness breeded greatness. Therefore, at this moment now, in the desert, HaKadosh Baruch Hu felt it was time to repay Miriam and demonstrate to her the significance of what she did all those years ago. He wanted to show her and the entire nation the reward that she merited to receive because she waited. She waited. Two million people waited for her in the merit of her waiting and seeing her brother through to safety the brother who became the great man that HaKadosh Baruch Hu defended and spoke so highly about. As I told you earlier, um, I always look for Simanim, that, that, that the shiurim that I'm giving. So, uh, you know, as I was building the shiur, uh, many topics came up with about the leadership, about Miriam Neviya, and so on and so forth, uh, Aharon Kohen. So, uh, as I was leaving my house, uh, this afternoon, I had to go somewhere. I told Hashem, Hashem, I had I just finished writing the part about Miriam and Nevia. I said, Hashem, send me a siman that I did okay with Miriam and Nevia, that every I got it right. Give give me a siman that uh, the concepts that I learned and that I read, that I actually uh, understood it properly. And where did I go? I went to the exchange place in order to exchange some dollars for a tzedakah that, that I collected in, in America for, for families in Netanya that could really use a helping hand. And I went to the exchange place. And as I'm giving the guy through the window the money through the slot, I look down, right? I look down and what do I see on my left? A little tiny little sticker of all stickers the guy could have had <laughs> over there. I'm putting it on because I took a picture of it right away. As you notice, what does it say? 
remember what happened to Miriam. And I'm looking at this and I'm like, oh my God, I say to him, shemo. I can't believe this. And he's like, what's going on? What happened? And I, and I tell him the whole story. And I'm saying, of all the things, why did you choose this sticker? He says, well, my wife and I, a while ago, we took it upon ourselves, Rashonara, and we learned about the whole story of Miriam and Nevia. So I wanted to put it here to remind everyone also that Am Yisrael should not speak about each other because we love each other. This is a wonderful nation. I'm like, oh my God, I can't believe this. So that was the second siman that I had, that Baruch Hashem, this, this shiur was okay. So the practical lesson, simple, practical, is obviously that of Lashon Ara and, and how careful we have to be not to speak. Miriam did not intend to speak Lashon Ara and yet she's punished. Uh, we're not on Miriam's level and therefore we have to be even more careful uh, you know, to speak, you know, how we speak. Dafko, because if Miriam was punished, even when she didn't intend to speak badly, kal v'chomer, or I said kal v'chomer, alachat kama v'kama, even more so when we speak uh, um, with certain intentions in mind. And we know when we say what we say, what we mean to say, and what messages we want to impart to the person who is listening. So we have to be very careful, very careful. And of course, the other lessons of the parasha that we learned today, I hope, will inspire us to respond accordingly to life, to challenges, to the people that we encounter. And Be'ezrat Hashem, in the merit of everything that we take upon ourselves from this shi'ur, in the schut of any mitzvah that we're going to complete, will be zaycheh to greet the Mashiach bekarov and be rewarded in kind for all the good that we did, not only at the beginning, but how we followed through until the very end. Amen, Ken.